I normally don't talk about current events in the crime world because my interest does not lie in solving or promoting crime. But I thought I would take this ARAB indictment situation to talk about a few other things you might find interesting. First of all, ARAB and his crew would almost certainly still have been indicted without uh, the Vlad TV interviews where it seems that he quote unquote told on himself. I'm gonna keep running to y'all. I got, I got enough money, man. Like, I don't even have to get my hand dirty. I can get y'all eradicated, man. So behave, man. <laughs> Cause I can sit back, man, and just like just dispatch. When the FBI comes to get you, they usually have a fair amount of evidence. I'm sure the Vlad and, and ARAB's other social media stuff may be introduced as evidence, but I'm sure they had other information. And just because there's no informants listed on the indictment doesn't mean anything. I don't know why people think that there's paperwork every time somebody gives information. There usually isn't. And federal prosecutors have told me this, so I know that it's true. Now, as for DJ Vlad, it is definitely true that he had ARAB on over and over and over and over. I mean, he was one of the more frequent guests recently, only because ARAB would talk pretty loosely about criminal activities. And Vlad did kind of walk him down the path to incriminating himself. And Vlad didn't really ask about his music very much. So why was ARAB there? Is DJ Vlad the police? No, he's not the police. Though some people I interview who contact me because they want to be interviewed tell me, and I've, you know, I've been with them when Vlad's calling them, and they don't want to go to Vlad's office because Vlad has the police there at the office many times. I was told. So why would ARAB a guy who's been to jail several times, who's definitely from the streets. I mean, he had to know he was at the edge and apparently went over the edge of incriminating himself. Why would he go on there and do it? Well, you live in the age of you can become a celebrity by making yourself a spectacle. ARAB doesn't play any instruments. He can't sing. You might like his rapping, but there's a lot of rappers. So how do you stand out? Well, you got to get media attention. And whether you're going to Oprah Winfrey show or say Fox News, you gotta give them what they want or you're not gonna come back. If you go on Fox News and you're not vaguely racist and stupid, you're not gonna go back on a second time. If you go on Vlad TV and you don't talk about when you got shot, how much dope you sold, this and that, who really killed Tupac, you're not gonna come back again, unless you're Lord Jamar. So if A.R. Ab hadn't have talked about crime and walk the line and maybe cross the line of confessing to some crimes, he probably wouldn't have been on there very much. And Vlad's platform gets a lot of views, so ARAB's career would not have grown as fast, not saying he wouldn't have had a career. So Ab wouldn't have been making as much money legally as he was in his rap career if he didn't walk the line of incriminating himself on Vlad TV and just on social media in general because other things he did on his own Instagram are far worse than what he did on Vlad where he says things like skinny me has more bodies than me, skinny me is scary, he's a real killer, this one's a real killer, I really bust my gun. I mean, if that's not confessing, if that's not, I mean, kind of dry snitching on somebody else, I don't know what it is. If skinny step on a, a splinter, I'm sending all my forces at you, and I got 50,000 of you. A personal friend of mine, a rapper from Detroit, he's currently doing a 16-year heroin conspiracy case, and a music video he made eight or nine years ago got introduced into evidence, and in the video he had, I don't know, like a million dollars in small bills in garbage bags. And that got introduced as evidence, so this is nothing new, and I don't understand why people are so shocked by it and why guys are still doing it, unless, of course, it's because, like I said, if you don't do it, how do you stand out from the crowd? What do you know most rappers for these days? The drugs they take, drugs they sell, how many times they got shot, who they shot. If you take that away from a lot of them, who are they? And ARAB seems kind of smart, so I'm sure he figured this out and he did what he had to do to get where he was trying to go, but maybe he did a little too much. If you think DJ Vlad is bad, 
go check out DJ Smalls. Now, the time you were shot, are you able to reflect and talk about that? Where every single interview is, tell us about the time you got shot 23 times. Hey, everybody and their mama was shooting at us, man. Boom, hit me in my back right here. How much lean do you drink? How long have you been a sipper for? How much did your crack house sell? There's a point where people were selling drugs and stuff. Rebrand myself and show people like the real me. Sometimes people complain on my channel that I cut my interview guests off or I interrupt them or there's weird cuts when they're talking. Well, maybe that's because they don't want to incriminate themselves with somebody else and I don't want my channel to be for incriminating things. I talk about old crimes because I'm interested in history, things that have been adjudicated, things that are in the newspaper. I don't want to hear about who killed so-and-so on July 10th and any unsolved murders. I could care less. The people I interview are usually either people I know or they're family members or close friends of somebody I know. So I have a different connection with most of them. Another interesting thing I've discovered is I've interviewed these very high-level gangsters from mobsters. And, uh, and uh, we had the guy, Sam, he got blowed up. Boom, the guy cut him right in half with yeah, a shotgun. He's, he's, he's gone. That shows you what kind of a cook he was. Dean Cartel to obviously the black gangsters is that a lot of them, they're sort of like movie stars. Like they're very charismatic and they like attention. And while killers respect killers, if all you are is a killer and all you are is feared, you're gonna get killed or told on real fast. We damn near killed every goddamn body there was to be killed. Those that we didn't kill ran and left the state. Those that didn't left the state went to prison. You gotta make people like you. Probably the reason BMF was able to last so long is because apparently people liked uh, Meech and T because I'm sure over the years a lot of people could have put them in jail. But the reality is, unlike the way the feds lay out drug cases where they say so-and-so worked for so-and-so and got his drugs from him, if you're a guy that's buying 10, 20 kilos of cocaine or thousands of pounds of marijuana or heroin every month, maybe Big Meech is the first guy you call, but if he doesn't have any, you know other people. And maybe one of the other guys you know, he had sex with your girlfriend, or he slapped you with the champagne bottle in the club. So when it's time for you to tell, you tell on one of them and you don't tell on the guy you like. Any real drug dealer will tell you, any big drug dealer, that if you're not willing to buy and sell drugs with people that are working with the feds, you're not gonna be buying and selling many drugs because so many people are working. You just gotta hope that they don't pick your name. From Al Capone to Pablo Escobar to Big Meech, many of the most famous gangsters, the most powerful, the richest, they love the attention more than the money. Because after you get it, you know, say $10 million, what are you really gonna do? In A.R. Ab's case, to quote him, what's the point of being the king of Philly if nobody else knows about it? You gotta tell the world how dangerous you are or it's no fun. And your mixtape isn't as popular. Now, this quest for attention is not limited to and was not started by black rappers or black criminals. Italian mobsters' love of running their mouth and wearing flashy jewelry has been many of their downfalls, such as the Dapper Don John Gotti. Another example is Detroit Mafia street boss Anthony Tony Jack Jackaloni. Scott Bernstein and I, my partner, did a documentary a long time ago called Detroit Mob Confidential. One story that didn't make it in was about when Tony Jack got convicted of tax evasion in the late 70s. The feds had a picture where he had on, I think, a pinky ring and a bracelet. They zoomed in on it. They had a jeweler come in and say that, oh, that watch and that ring or whatever he was wearing is worth, you know, $100,000. And at the time, Jack Aloney might have been claiming he was a, you know, a salesman or something and he made $30,000 a year. Well, if you make $30,000 a year and you got a mortgage and you got two kids in college, how do you have $100,000 of jewelry on your left hand? Tax evasion number one. Tax evasion number two in the same case, he testified he inherited a bunch of money from his father who was a, a fruit peddler in the 19 teens and 20s and 30s in Eastern Market uh, a long time ago in Detroit. So the federal prosecutors brought Tony Jack's family on the stand, his wife, his sons, 
And they said, oh, did, did, did you see your dad or your husband's uh, money that he inherited from his father? And they said, yeah, we saw it. And they said, oh, what did it look like? Was it in nice big bundles, straight bundles? Like from, they said, yep, nice big bundles of cash he had. So then the federal prosecutor brought in the official historian of the U.S. Treasury Department who testified and showed examples that in the past, the early part of the 20th century, bills, U.S. denominational bills, they weren't the same size. A $10 bill in 1930 might not be the same size as a $1 bill in 1946, which is not the same the size of, as a $5 bill in 1921. Needless to say, Tony Giacalone was convicted of tax evasion, sent to prison. And one more mafia case for you, uh, Pete Lamoni. Pete Lamoni was convicted in Boston of being a, he was a mobster, he was convicted of murder along with two other guys in 1968. Falsely convicted on the testimony of uh, Joel the Animal Barbosa, who was like the first, uh, well, second big mafia snitch after Joe Valachi. In 1998, they got exonerated because the Whitey Bulger case was unfolding and it was came out that the Boston FBI basically was totally corrupted by Whitey Bulger and any cases they did were all suspect. So these three guys got exonerated. Pete Lamoni got out of prison. The other two guys had already died in prison. Lamoni got a hundred million dollar settlement from the state of Massachusetts. So what did he do? He went back into the mob business. He became the consigliere of the Patriarcha New England crime family, and then he became the boss. So he was in his 80s, he had a $100 million settlement from the state, which means you make 10 million a year just in interest. But he still wanted to be the boss of the mob family. And late in life, he caught another case, they made him do, I think, a year or two for bookmaking or something. And I don't know if he died in prison or he died right when he got out, so. What really motivates criminals, it's not always the money. And in today's world, it's probably not primarily money, it's primarily fame. So hopefully A.R. Ab and his crew were just hamming it up for the camera. I don't know. Hopefully they, you know, get off with not too bad of a sentence. I don't know. But uh, stay woke. The prophet has spoken. Cut it off.